because the last three chapters of the book of Revelation are not going to happen in their day. They haven't happened yet. They will happen. So in se chapter 7 of the book of Revelation, and verse 9, it says, Then he looked. There was a great multitude. You see, this is basically the same people. He heard, verse 4, the number. Only 144,000. Get that? Don't let it out of your mind. Verse 9, then I looked. So he hears, there's 144,000, he looks. There's the 144,000. But they're not really. They're a great multitude. Do you understand that? Not too hard to understand? Because it's the same people. They're not actually there, you know. They're not actually there. Where are the 144,000? Where are they going to suddenly come from in the midst of all this? And where are all the multitude in verse 9 going to come from that no one can count? From every nation, from all tribes and so forth. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. Let's understand the book of Revelation is signs and symbols. It doesn't go on chronologically. There's scenes, scene after scene. There's no time in heaven, is there? No time. So they're not to do with time. He's looking into heaven. He's not looking on earth. This is all in heaven. The whole thing is in heaven. The 144,000 is a sign that's shown from heaven, not shown as being on earth. The same with all of them. They represent something. And the 144,000 are representative of another scene that he sees. They're a great multitude. All these people standing there. The same people. But then, what's he seeing them doing? They've, they're in white. And they cry out. And they say, salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. This is not an Old Testament scene, or drawn from the Old Testament. There might be people there from the Old Testament, but the scene isn't, because throughout the whole of the Old Testament, if you mention Saviour, it's always God our Saviour. Here, it includes the Lamb. So it's a New Testament scene. That has nothing to do with the tribes of Israel. You get the picture? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's now revealed that this is the new Israel. Nothing to do with the old Israel that had 12 tribes. And there aren't 12 tribes up here anyway, there's only 11. So there's another clue. It's a, not a natural 12 or 11 tribes of Israel. And tell me this, all these people who follow that idea that it's going to naturally happen. Where, are, where is the genealogy of those tribes of Israel in existence today in the world? Doesn't it doesn't exist. If there was, it was destroyed at the temple when it was burnt. There's no genealogy today. Have you ever heard of the tribe of Asher around the world? It doesn't exist. None of the Jews in Israel say, mention they're from certain, any tribes now, do they? Because, of course, we know they're not Jews, they're Kazakhs. 
you know, we need to think about these things. Look, I don't know how it is that I'm thinking these things, I have to say. I just think it has to be the Spirit of God. I, I really do. A anyway, it's from God anyway. That's all I can say. And uh, so it's about the new Israel. And the new saviour of the new Israel is the Lamb of God. At the back is God. The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God was never the saviour then of Israel. The Lamb of God was the saviour of the remnant of Israel who looked forward to Christ, but he wasn't their saviour then. He was their future saviour that they were hanging on to. And their sins were forgiven, as it says in Romans, I think it was chapter 3, where he passed over their sins he passed over their sins because he knew Jesus, the Lamb of God, was going to die on the cross for their sins too. So here, in this multitude, would be the remnants of Israel who were in heaven. Who all from the time of Abraham believed in the Christ. Abraham was there in that multitude. So was David, so was Moses. They're all up there in heaven. So is Elijah. Moses and Elijah came down from heaven on the Mount of Transfiguration. They're still living, they're up there. But John doesn't see them as such. Not even in a vision. But they're there. And what are they doing? They're robed in white. What, hap what does that mean? Purity, no sin. We're not going to naturally wear a robe of white. What we're going to look like, nobody knows. What our form is going to appear as, we don't know. But we will be robed in white. In this sense, that we're washed in the blood of Jesus, pure and spotless. As it says in Isaiah chapter 1, and this is how the remnant of Israel got into heaven, though your sins be as crimson, they shall be as wool, I think it is. Though your sins be red, they shall be as white as snow. White. Our sins were red. They're gone. They're gone, brothers and sisters. The blood of Jesus has cleansed us. We're white. We wear white. And when we get to heaven, we, we, we'll be like them. Robes of white. With palm branches in their hands. Now that signifies joy and worship. What did the people do before Jesus went to the cross? When he ascended the hill on a on an ass or a mule, whatever you like to call it. They cut down the palm branches and he on his donkey, as, as prophesied in the book of Zechariah, went up the hill and the people said, Hosanna to the son of David. Now, wasn't that a divine inspiration they had from God? And afterwards, many of them went and crucified him. But they sang Hosanna to the son of David because that's who he is after the flesh. And it also reminds us, I think, of the Old Testament Feast of Tabernacles when they cut down the branches and had to make little huts on the, the roofs of the houses and so forth to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a feast of joy, which I believe was fulfilled also on the day of Pentecost as indeed was the Feast of Pentecost. And then, what are they singing? We already said that. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might. Seven. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. 
And I think it's in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 12, chapter 11, where it speaks about a branch coming out of the root of David, who of course is Christ, and he has the spirit of holiness, and I think there are seven spirits that it mentions that Christ is. Well here, if you like to refer to that sometime and have a look, you'll be able to compare it yourself. He's got blessing, glory, and honor, thanksgiving, honor, and power, and might, and be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So they're saying this not only to the God, Father, but they're saying it to the Lamb. He is God. Two of them. Two beings. There. The Spirit is not there on his throne. He has a throne. As it says in the Apocalypse of Isaiah. That that Baptist also would recommend. And then an elder addresses him. And we, I think we are, I, I omitted to say verse 11. And all the angels stood around the throne. And around the elders and the four living beings. And this is peculiar because the elders were representative of these holy ones and so were the four living beings and we've done that. But you see, it's just a sign. As elders, they worshipped. As four living beings, they worshipped. As angels, they also worshipped. And with the angels, they also worshipped. Now to my mind, chapter 7 verse 10, about all these people standing there, is somewhat pivotal to the book and the message of Revelation. It's eventually about the redeemed. And this is the hope that the writer from Jesus and from God is presenting to the people because the last three chapters of the book of Revelation are not going to happen in their day. They haven't happened yet. They will happen. Because that's when we're all in heaven after the judgment seat has happened and after they've gone to hell and we are gone to heaven and we're at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a going to happen. And what will we be doing there? God will be in our midst. And here, they're standing before the throne and before the Lamb. It says in the end of the book of Revelations that we need no sun because the Lamb is, and the God is the light there. So forth. You can read it for yourselves. So I think that this verse is somewhat pivotal. Because in the end, it's all about that scene, that eternal scene in heaven. And this is what is being presented to those who are suffering tribulation and will suffer tribulation here on earth. Look ahead. That's where you're ending up. Because Jesus said in the world you will have tribulation, every one of us. Now, not every one of us will be martyrs. Not every one of us has gone to war. And most, a lot of people haven't yet been in the war. Maybe there will be one in the next few years. We don't know. Whatever happens, look ahead. Because we have to set our eyes on our heavenly kingdom. It says in Colossians, set your affection on things above, not on things of this earth. Because you're dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. And when he shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. And here's the scene in the book of Revelation, the glory. Just, just looking through a smoke glass, that's all it is. It's vivid to John, but it's a mere fragment of what the reality will be. And as we read it, it's a mere small indication of what the reality will be. That's where we're headed. It's not just going to heaven singing around the throne, which of course was a blessing to me as a teenager because I believed it, and it's true. There's glory here. And the book is about the glory of heaven. Look at it. 
Look at them all up there. You'll be like that one day. And the basis of it all, of course, is the atoning death of Christ and the blood of Christ. It's not of man. And the message here is he's on the throne. All is under his rule. The lamb shares the rule. And this is in Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 3, because it says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. That's the Father talking to the Son after the resurrection. After he sat down at the right hand of God, having made purification for sins. Hebrews 1, verses 10 and 11, and in verse 13, it says what is prophesied in Psalm 110, verses 1, 2, and 5, and it quotes exactly what is said. Sit by my side. You are a ruler with me. And yet, sitting there, then, as written in the book of Revelation, it's being spoken about the wrath of the Lamb. See, it says, it says at the end of chapter 6, Hide us from the one on the throne and the face of the wrath of the Lamb. And so these people are being hidden. They never get the fullness of the wrath of God or of the wrath of the Lamb. Because martyrdom will not be the fullness for them. That's a different thing. And the people in Jerusalem are going to escape. As Jesus said they would in, uh, in Mark 12, 36, Matthew 22, 44, and Luke 20, 20, 42, about the exaltation of Christ there is there. But in Matthew 24 and, and Mark and Luke, you'll find Jesus said they had to escape. And Paul said in Acts 2, verse 33, Christ is exalted on the right hand of God. So here he is, exalted on the right hand of God. And the seal speaks of ownership, as it tells us, uh, about them. In verse 14, they are sealed. He's, and then the angel says, in response to who are they, they come out of the great tribulation. 67, 70 AD, three and a half years. That happened specifically for Jerusalem. And it was going on in Israel. And that kind of thing was going on all around the Roman Empire. But specifically, for Jerusalem. And those Christians in Jerusalem were part of this body of people, the 12 tribes of Israel that's mentioned here. They were passed with male, female and children. And they all escaped. But they eventually died. And that church that they formed outside of Jerusalem afterwards, they escaped about AD 69. And they went to, uh, I forget the name of the place, it starts with a P. And they went there, they died out. You never hear or read anything much about them after, ever after. That Judaizing church died out because they were Judaizers, but they were still Christians. But the churches of Asia Minor lasted for quite a time or came to life again for quite a time. And I think there's still an Orthodox Church around those parts today, which probably is the Syrian Orthodox Church, but I'm not sure. Petra. Starts with a P. Petra. Yeah, they went to Petra and they went to the mountains around about. And then it says, and this is the reason they're worshipping, and you'll read that in, in verses 15 to 17. And they worship God day and night. And, you know, look, I've been anointed and blessed worshipping God. And I've heard people say, Ah, oh, fancy doing that in heaven. Is that all it's going to be? I tell you, you get in the Spirit and anointed by the Spirit and worship God. It's heavenly. That's all you can say, as most of us have experienced. And so, from verse 10 on, you've got all the angels. 
who are the cherubim, are the elders. You've got the angels, you've got the elders, you've got the four cherubim, bim, and they all fall prostrate in front of the Lamb. As we said before, verse 12 is a kind of doxology of seven parts. And Paul said in Acts 2, verse 33, Christ is exalted on the right hand of God. So here he is, exalted on the right hand of God.